during the first couple of weeks, not even that, during the first couple of days, there were people that were already protesting when Israel didn't even attack back, when Israel didn't even start an intervention claiming the right of self-defense, as it has that moral obligation to defend its citizens after one of the worst massacres that we've witnessed against the Jewish people. There were people that were already protesting and calling for a ceasefire that didn't even, there was a ceasefire in place on October the 7th, and that was clearly breached by Hamas, a terrorist organization that many people for some reason are afraid to call it as such. It is a terrorist genocidal organization. Hello and welcome to the European Conservatives Brussels headquarters. I have Juan Cades Rodriguez in here with me. Thank you so much for, for joining us and taking the time to make this interview. Thank you for the invitation. Happy to be here. We're going to discuss uh, the, the rising anti-Israel attitudes at the European and international levels and what uh, European Jewish Association can do to change the situation. So first, let me ask um, uh, about the association's work and the role it plays uh, in, in Europe and the EU. So, well, first of all, thank you once again for the invitation. Very happy to be here. The European Jewish Association was founded um, about 20 years ago here uh, in the European capital in Brussels. And the main goal of the organization is to combat anti-Semitism, which we see especially, and we'll get into it since October the 7th, how it's been skyrocketing, unfortunately. And not only do we focus on combating anti-Semitism all across the continent, but we also focus on representing hundreds of communities, of Jewish communities from all across Europe, from the Western Hemisphere, all the way from Spain and Portugal, all the way to places like Poland, Moldova, etc. And along with representing the interests of the Jewish community and combating anti-Semitism, we want to make sure that we can foster Jewish life in Europe. And those are, we could say, our three main goals. Obviously, October 7th was a pivotal moment for Israel. But how did you experience that devastating day here in Brussels? Well, unfortunately, it's one of those days that is, um, it's already marked in our Jewish calendars as one of the most tragic and fateful days of the Jewish people, as we saw the largest massacre of Jews since the times of the Shoah, of the Holocaust. Um, I will remember that day, obviously, and I, it's one of those days that I'll never forget. It was Saturday 7th, it was Shabbat, a holy day for us as Jews. Uh, it was also Simchat Torah, Torah uh, a very important Jewish festivity, so those two collided together. And I remember that very early in the morning, as soon as we started to receive news from Israel around five, six in the morning with the time difference, I remember seeing the videos of the massacre as they were taking place in the Kibbutzim and in the Moshabim in South Israel. Um, and those images are always going to be with me, unfortunately. And it was... It was a tragic day. I remember that I went to the synagogue that day as we were coming up with the end of Simchat Torah and Shabbat. And you have to understand from the Jewish perspective, Simchat Torah is one of the most important days in Judaism. And it's a very joyous occasion in which we all congregate and we celebrate and we're happy. And I remember that I felt devastated because I couldn't bring myself to be happy after the images of what was happening in Israel to my fellow Jewish brothers and sisters um, in Nazi side. So, as I said, it was a very sad day. And ever since, it's been five months. And it's still a country that is very much traumatized by what happened. And we're also seeing the consequences here in the diaspora, as diaspora Jews, of how it's affecting us in our daily lives uh, in the European continent, in the US, that we'll get into. And it's sad to see how anti-Semitism has been skyrocketing through the lens of anti-Zionism. And I never thought in my life that I would be able to see such high levels of anti-Semitism once again um, in the European continent after what we had to go through 80 years ago during the Holocaust, because we thought that never again meant something. But we saw that for many people that meant nothing. Those were empty words. And once again, anti-Semitism is very much alive. And it's something that we have to dedicate every single fiber of our beings to fight it against. My colleagues and I saw a lot of pro-Palestinian uh, marches here in Brussels after the Israeli operations in Gaza started. Uh, but 
most European countries um, experience the same when it comes to the pro-Palestinian protests. How did it feel to hear the um, pro-Hamas, uh, you know, well-known chants uh, on the streets week week by week? Um, and how did the association, your association, react to the protests? So it's funny that you bring that up because even before Israel retaliated back and started the operations in Gaza, because people need to understand that was three weeks right after October the 7th. During the first couple of weeks, not even that, during the first couple of days, there were people that were already protesting when Israel didn't even attack back, when Israel didn't even start an intervention claiming the right of self-defense, as it has that moral obligation to defend its citizens after one of the worst massacres that we've witnessed against the Jewish people. There were people that were already protesting and calling for a ceasefire that didn't even... There was a ceasefire in place on October the 7th, and that was clearly breached by Hamas, a terrorist organization that many people, for some reason, are afraid to call it as such. It is a terrorist, genocidal organization, and you can clearly see that on their charter. When they were founded in 1987, there are certain articles in which they invoke and they say, death to the Jews, whatever you may see a Jew hiding under a tree, under a table, you have to kill it. And one of their main goals is to annihilate and end with the Jewish state, with Israel. A state in which, by the way, 20% of the population is Arab-Israeli, meaning that they would also kill uh, their fellow, quote unquote, uh, Muslim brothers and sisters. And that's what we saw when they, came, when they came in on October the 7th, the way that they indiscriminately started to mutilate, rape, and burn people alive. Um, as to the chants, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Globalized Intifada are well-known chants that we knew. And what we see is that, as we call them, there are a good amount of useful idiots that they have here on the streets of Europe, um, especially mainly from the far left movement um, that deeply cares about human rights, as they say. But then you see them in this strange alignment of Islamists with far left people. And you realize that it says the enemy of the enemy is my friend, so we have to get rid of Israel. But once we do that, there's nothing that they have in common. Those people have nothing in common. If you think about it, Israel's that bastion of freedom in the Middle East. So once we end with Israel, then imagine that you're part of one of those minorities, such as the LGBTQ, for example. Do you think the LGBT community has any rights whatsoever in the Gaza Strip that is governed by Hamas? No. Do you think that the feminist movement has any rights in the Gaza Strip? No. And I could go with other minorities, but you see them here chanting on the streets alongside those radical people. Once they've exterminated, because that is their goal, once they've exterminated us, they're next, and that's what they don't. Know. That's what they don't get to see, and that's why we call them those useful idiots. So obviously, it really does hurt to see that there are so many people out there in Europe, in all the European capitals, all the way from Madrid to Warsaw, seeing thousands of people congregated, calling for the end and the destruction and the death to the Jewish state, the only Jewish state in the world, and to see people chanting things that they don't even know about, because from the river to this is a good example. If you ask them which river. A good amount of people will not be able to point on the map which river it is. Same goes to the U.S. on college campuses that we'll talk about. Globalized intifada. People don't even know what the intifada was about, the first and the second intifada, and what that entails, and the level of incitement towards violence and hate. So, of course, it's not easy to grasp to see that in all major European capitals. It is very sad to see that, and from our organization, obviously, one of the main goals that we have is that there, pretty much every single European government has adopted their definition, which we think it's key to understanding how anti-Semitism like a virus mutates. Rabbi Sachs will put it once. Lord Rabbi Sachs used to say that first, the way that anti-Semitism mutes is that first it started through that persecution of our religion beliefs. The Spanish Inquisition, the country in which I was born, is a clear and sad example of it with the expulsion of its Jews in 1492. Then it came the persecution against the Jewish people through the lens of the so-called race, as Hitler used to call it. And that ended up with the Holocaust, as we all know it. And then it was the persecution of the nation state of Israel in 1948. So you see that there's a common pattern. There's a pattern of anti-Semitism. Now it's through the lens of anti-Zionism. 
But many people will say that they're obviously not anti-Semitic because who could ever say that they're anti-Semitic after what we saw with Hitler 80 years ago? No one, very few people want to be associated to that. So instead that they will say that they are anti-Zionist. But once again, if you ask them what Zionism is, they will not be able to tell you. Zionism is nothing more than the right of self-determination of the Jewish people to have their own state in their own ancestral homeland in Judea and Samaria. That's it, plain and simple. And one of our main goals is that our definition has to be enacted because even though it's not binding from a legal point of view, we think that it is essential and vital that all the relevant authorities from national governments, regional governments, municipal governments, and the police and the prosecutor's offices and the judges understand and see with practical examples how anti-Semitism must be combated in the 21st century. Let's circle a bit back to the issue of useful idiots. Uh, do you think there's a danger that these people end up not just regurgitating what they hear in the mainstream media, but end up in dangerous places, so to speak, and actually engage in anti-Semitic actions? Well, as to your second question, well, obviously yes, because we saw it with the example of Adolf Hitler. Many people didn't take him seriously because he was just a crazy guy in one of the beer bars in Munich, chanting crazy anti-Semitic things. And many people thought that, I mean, who would take this guy seriously, right? History proved that sometimes, not sometimes, many times, words have a meaning. And many people are not aware of how much we should value the importance of speaking um, in decent terms and using language properly in our conversations. Because we saw the result with the aftermath of what Hitler started once he got democratically elected in 1933 and in 1945, six million Jews, one third of the Jewish population was completely exterminated. And it all started because of this crazy guy chanting in Munich. So uh, I think that there's a very clear pattern and a dangerous one with that. And in terms of, especially with the youth these days, what I do see, and we saw it in one of the most recent polls that were conducted in the US, for example, America has always been that unconditional ally to Israel. But as the war carries on within time, we see that there's a major gap between the generation of people that are 45, 50, 60 year olds and 20, 30 year olds. The 20, 30 year olds from both sides, from more from the left, from the traditional Democratic Party, is completely aligning themselves with the Palestinian cause. And in this case, even with Hamas, um, which is very concerning and turbulent, that's something that I never thought I would see coming from our biggest ally. And that is something that I'm terrified about because once that generation is gone, what does the future of the US and Europe look like? I think that one of the big problems of our society, so is that there's no, there are no critical spirits. There are no free critical spirits, let me put it that way. And I think that Social media is the one to blame in many ways because we want everything summarized, condensed in one minute TikToks, one minute reels on Instagram. And there's no depth, there's no debate. Also, we think that everything is black or white, good or bad. No, things are much more complex. Things are gray, history is gray. History is there for you not to like it or dislike it, but for you, from, for you to learn from it. That's what I take from it. The history of the Jewish people, 90% of it is surrounded by tragic chapters of attempts of extermination, genocides, ethnic cleansing. But here we are. We always try to see the bright side of things. And that's why our national anthem, Atikva, the hope, it's important to have hope. But on top of that, I think that it's really important to raise a generation of leaders that understands that we have to go back to the basics because it seems like everything that was traditional, we have to completely get rid of it. The other day I had a great quote that was, in order to build a cathedral, you need convictions, not opinions. And nowadays we care deeply, even I would say, even, I would argue even too much about our own personal feelings and our own opinion, as opposed to our moral convictions. And I think that what this world is lacking from is moral clarity. There's no convictions. People don't want to fight anymore. And I don't mean just like physical fight, I mean intellectually. And I sincerely hope that we'll be able to go back to those times in which we can engage in peaceful dialogues, 
in conversations with others in which we can understand that the first basis for that is having mutual respect and that if you attack someone, you attack their ideas, their rationale, not them personally. But because this generation is very much focused on their feelings and we get offended so easily with everything, then we have a problem with that. So hopefully we'll be able to, um, as I said, go back to those basics uh, and realize that the moment that we engage with others in those conversations with respect, there's a lot more that unites us than what it divides us as human beings. The European institutions were a bit indecisive in their support for Israel, to say the least. Uh, first, let's take the European Parliament. I personally uh, didn't expect uh, the majority of MEPs to stand firmly by Israel, but I was surprised, even shocked, to see the more radical reactions. Um, like one member uh, was trying to give a speech in Strasbourg wearing a Palestinian headscarf, uh, calling Gaza an Israeli extermination camp. Um, are these separate, are these isolated cases or part of a more general pattern on the left? So as for the person that you are describing, um, he's someone that we know quite well. As a Spaniard, I know quite well who he is. That man is Manu Pineda. Um, and he's part of the Communist Party. He's the chair of the delegation of the relations between Palestine and the European Union. He's an outspoken anti-Semite who even came out a couple of months ago comparing Bibi Netanyahu, the leader of a democratic country, the only Jewish and democratic state in the world, with Adolf Hitler. There is nothing more miserable to do than to compare a Jewish man that you may disagree, even despise on many levels. Ask half of the population in Israel what they think of Bibi Netanyahu, even 70% of the population what they think of him before with the judicial reform, with the judicial overhaul that was taking place, and after October the 7th. And you will not hear pretty things about Bibi Netanyahu. But that is one thing, another very different thing is to compare a Jewish person to the perpetrator of the person that tried to exterminate each and every single Jew all across the globe. It is deeply disturbing, it is deeply disgusting, and it is deeply anti-Semitic. So that being said, we do see that Zionism was very much founded on the left. And I always advocated for that movement, for that beautiful movement, as a proud Zionist that I am, it should not be distinguished upon different political colors. It should be a unifying force because I already gave the definition of what Zionism is. It should not be from the right to the, it shouldn't be something that should be so polarized. But sad, I don't know why, sadly these days, we see that that traditional support that Zionism had from the left, from traditional center left parties, is completely gone. The left these days, for some reason, has embraced, it's not incompatible to defend the Israeli cause and the Palestinian cause. Many people, especially many people that were massacred on October the 7th, were the first ones that advocated for a two-state solution. This is what people don't understand. Most of the people that were brutally mutilated, murdered, and massacred on October the 7th were some of the most secular leftist Jews in the land of Israel. Those were people that were advocating for a two-state solution. Those were people that would invite their Palestinian friends to their homes, that would give them work permits, etc. So many people, not now after October the 7th, you can talk about a two-state solution when most people are still so traumatized and you saw it with the overwhelming majority in the Knesset voting in favor of keeping a one-state solution for now and an opposing to a Palestinian state with 100 MKs voting in favor of it because it's been five months. People need to, they're still very much traumatized. That's what people understand. Even in this world, news by by really, really fast, and something that happened five months ago is whole news, it's still very much recent. So I hope that we'll be able to come back to a place in which Zionism will not be weaponized by some people, polarized by others, and will come to a mutual understanding and compromise from the right and the left, and they'll be able to see that the Jewish people deserve to have their own state, their own homeland, and not to not be subject to such double standards when other states are not subject to the double standards that Israel is, and especially states that commit the worst atrocities when it comes to having such low um, 
ratings with um, with human rights, especially some of the worst dictatorships in the world that I think that we all know about. So, yeah, it is um, sad to see that, but at the end of the day, also grateful to the conservative parties for their support. But we saw and we knew that as soon as Israel started to retaliate back uh, in that right of self-defense, we knew that we were going to lose support. We fully knew that. And we see that now, as of right now, except the US and the UK a bit more, and traditionally Germany, even though Germany is starting to fade away a bit more, we see that most countries have already turned their backs on, on us. And we could clearly see it with UNRWA, which is something that I'm sure that we will discuss about very soon. And it's it's really sad to see that our European brothers and sisters and what you would consider as the home of democracy, human rights, and liberty is turning its back on the only democracy of the Middle East, which is Israel. Um, so who are the who are who are these member states whom Tel Aviv can still count on? When we talk about Europe slowly, yeah, of, of course. course. Of course. I mean, we there are a good amount of European states that Israel can still count on. Because one thing is words, another thing is actions, as we all know. So obviously the US, it's our unconditional ally. It's Israel's unconditional ally, and you see it because President Biden is from the Democratic Party, but the reaction from the Republican Party would have been the same, exactly the same. Um, in the case of Europe, I have to say that President Sunak has been a great supporter, and he was the first, along with von der Leyen and Metzola, the first among one of the first, along with Macron, to visit Israel. And still to this day, one of the very few leaders who still opposes the call to a ceasefire, which is very important. And I want to get to this for just a minute. Most people, if you ask in Israel, do they want a ceasefire? Yes. Israelis do not want this war. They didn't start this war. Just like they didn't start any of the single wars starting in 1948. Israelis want to live in peace with their Palestinian brothers. Do you think that in, the Israeli parents are happy to send their 18, 19, 20, 21 year old kids to war? No, they're not. No one in their right mind is. But when you have to defend yourself and you have no other choice, that's it, that's what you have to do. I want to see fire. Most people want to see fire, but that comes with two easy things that Israel has been saying since day one, release all the hostages and unconditional surrender by Hamas. That's it. Hamas could easily end this war if they did those two things. Release all the hostages, not prisoners, as many people like Manu Pineda have pointed out that they're prisoners. How could a one-year-old baby be a prisoner? What's the crime that a one-year-old baby has committed? Being born Jewish? And second of all, surrender, militarily speaking. That's it. We'll have war. This war, sorry, we'll have peace. This war will be completely over in less than 24 hours. But Hamas has other priorities as they use their population as human shields, as we all know, as we've been able to see hospitals, hospitals schools, kindergartens. And that's the sad reality of it. I mean, Israel, it's been estimated that they've destroyed about 20 to 30 percent of the tunnels. But what they've built there is larger than the underground tunnels in, in London to put it into perspective, into the huge scale of what we're talking about. So, and you saw it, I mean, with some of the Hamas officials. October the 7th was a great day, we'll do it again and again. And what happens above the ground, that's something that the UN has to care about. We were underground. These are some of the statements coming out from some of the spokesperson and the spokesman from Hamas. So it is very difficult when you have to enter a diplomatic um, conversation with a terrorist organization that maximizes civilian casualties, as opposed to a democratic state that is being subject to double standards and to the perception of the public opinion that is very much against Israel as we know it on mainstream media, and trying to minimize as much as they could, as they can, those civilian casualties. The latest scandal uh, is about the UN's refugee agency that was slowly created for the Palestinians. Um, it surfaces that um, several employees of the agency are Hamas members, just like Israel had claimed for years now. Mm -hmm. um, so 
of course, many EU member states have cut their fundings as a result, but not the EU Commission. How is it possible that the yeah. Commission keeps funding such such an agency? I agree. So in the case of UNRWA, I'm not saying that there shouldn't be any humanitarian help and aid to the Palestinians, to the many Palestinian civilians, innocent civilians that have nothing to do with this. I'm not saying that, but I think that we should find a different way that UNRWA. I think UNRWA is not the solution. I think it's very much part of the problem in many ways. And I think it's time for it to, to, to be gone. And I was very happy to see their reaction from many countries stopping and freezing the funding that was going into uh, UNRWA. But at the same time, when you see Mr. Borre from my country again, um, the head of, one could say, the head of foreign relations for the European Union, the spokesperson for foreign affairs from the European Union, who is very much saying, no, 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 this is the moment in which we should exactly do the opposite. We should increase funding for UNRWA. And you see Spain also increasing funding for UNRWA, then it's kind of contradictory based on the evidence that we're seeing, not only because we saw that there were 11 to 12 people that were working for UNRWA that were there, that were part of the October 7th massacre, that act actively contributed to what happened, but also that behind the headquarters, we were able to discover one of the many, well, obviously the tunnels, but also Hamas having, uh, when it comes to data inf and information and all of that, they had one of their main headquarters stored right under UNRWA headquarters. And then the church and the spokesperson for UNRWA came out saying, we had no idea. We didn't know about any of this. You're telling me that for almost two decades you didn't know about what was happening right on the earth, underground, really? So when you see all the evidence that has been presented, it is very difficult to believe that UNRWA is very much the solution to the future of um, the Palestinian issue as they see it. So. The ruling of the International Court of Justice following South Africa's initiative was also an important turning point. Um, what are the implications uh, of that and where does the case stand now? So the case was very much, um, if I may put it bluntly, a disgrace. So the fact that the convention comes in right after the Holocaust, because there was an actual Holocaust taking place against the Jewish people, the fact that now you see the Jewish state sitting in, at the International Court of Justice as not the victims of October the 7th, but as the perpetrators and the oppressors of this case, it's really surreal. To see the former president of the Supreme Court, Barak, who is a Holocaust survivor, flying from Israel and sitting on the panel and being one of the 17 judges, a 90-year-old man who actually went through a Holocaust, sitting in there and having to see his homeland, Israel, sitting and being prosecuted as the one who committed a genocide against the Palestinian people. I mean, where did we get to? It's surreal. It really is surreal. So it really is a disgrace that out of all countries, South Africa is the one that has brought this claim on behalf of, um, of, I'm sorry to put it this way, but Hamas, I mean, it's, it's a clear example of it. There's a genocidal organization that is openly saying to the world that our main goal is to exterminate all Jews and to annihilate an entire state openly on the charter. You can find that to this day. So they should be the ones who be sitting, so that should be sitting right on the bench, but no. It's Israel, the country that is trying its utmost to minimize civilian casualties and to protect its citizens because it has a right, morally and internationally, legally speaking, to defend its, to defend its citizens after the massacre, after the October 7th massacre. And obviously, people are concerned, but to a certain extent, people need to understand that no matter what happens, this process is going to take many years until there, it's, there's a final... Uh, outcome of it and the final verdict. So first of all, it's going to take many years. Second of all, they cannot really enforce it because at the end of the day, it's not legally binding. So that's second. The third of all, obviously, many people are concerned because Israel could take a diplomatic hard blow after this. And that is something that obviously many people are, I for one, I am concerned. But at the same time, I must say that where was the International Court of Justice 
when there was an actual genocide taking place in Rwanda 30 years ago? Where was the International Court of Justice when there was an actual genocide taking place in Srebrenica, in Bosnia, just around the corner in Europe? And we could name many other cases or some of the worst human rights atrocities that were committed not even 10 years ago in Syria with the use of chemical weapons with Bashar al-Assad or the civil war in Yemen or how China is doing and perpetrating a genocide against the Uyghur community in the Muslim population or the Rohingya. And I could go on and on, but why are those countries not sitting on the bench? Why is Israel the one that has to be subject to those double standards? That is very much revealing to the levels of anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism that we perceive from many states in the world. And you can clearly see it, Sophie, and I'll wrap up with this, with all the international condemnations that there's been at the Human Rights Council from the UN. 96 to Israel in the last 15 years, but then some of the worst autocratic dictatorships in the world, they haven't even received 5, 10, 15, or 20. Some of the worst dictatorships in the world that we're talking about. But... It has to be the only democracy in the Middle East that has to be strongly condemned, treated differently than the rest of the other countries, and God knows why. So what's next for the European Jewish Association? I presume that the war in Gaza, with God's will, will end at some point, mm -hmm. but um, the implications of it uh, will follow Jewish communities and, and Jews in Europe for a long time. Of course, and well, first of all, we hope that the war will end as soon as possible. That is our priority, obviously, as one could understand righteously so. But you're right, the ramifications and the implications of October the 7th cannot be perceived already in European soil, here in the diaspora. And many Jewish communities are absolutely terrified because there's been already, for example, just a couple of days ago in Zurich, in the city of Zurich, a 15, 16 year old teenager tried, not tried, actually successfully stabbed an Orthodox man and that man is in stable condition, thanks God, and he was not killed. But that is just one example that could be extrapolated to many other cases that have happened in Europe since October the 7th. People are terrified to wear their kippot. People are terrified to wear their Magen Davids. Jewish students are terrified of going to their respective college campuses and they're hiding their identity. How could that be? Where are the relevant authorities in all of this? Why are they not? I mean, clearly you see it with the congressional hearing in the US with Harvard, Yale, and UPenn. I mean, the own deans of the universities couldn't come out and, condone and say when they asked them if an, a call for an extermination of the Jewish people could a claim to genocide and hate speech. And they said, well, it's context dependent. So there you go. If the deans of this so-called most prestigious universities cannot even say that, imagine the rest of the people here in Europe. So very much concern, but at the same time, the European Jewish Association is gonna be here fighting for the rights of the European Jewish community, for the hundreds of communities that we represent, fostering Jewish life, because not only protecting and fighting against anti-Semitism, as I said, which is not a fun job, but also fostering Jewish life, because very, sometimes we very much focus on the negative aspect of the word of anti-Semitism, because clearly it's still there, but fostering Jewish life, because the European Commission presented a plan that very much focused on fostering Jewish life. What does that mean? For me, that means that we should be able to talk about the great contributions that the Jewish people have done to Europe, because you cannot understand Europe without Judaism. 2,000 years of unity in spite of all of the horrible things that have happened during those 2,000 years that we all know, it is still very much ingrained in the European fabric. So I think that we should be very much focusing on and emphasizing the positive cultural, religious, political, scientific, literary, artistic advancements, advancements sorry, that were brought up from the Jewish community and we should advocate for fostering not only Jewish life, but a bigger cohesion between the Jewish and the Christian community, because I believe they, the Jew, the Christian values are very much um, in danger and jeopardized at the moment. And this is a time in which we should both come together to realize that we have a lot of enemies out there, 
because I always say this, Israel is first. But the moment that will not happen, but the moment that they finish with Israel, Europe is next, the US is next. In other words, the West is next. So this is why we must stand together firm with moral clarity and moral convictions and say that that's not gonna happen and that we have to be proud of that, not only that Jewish, that Jewish and Christian alliance, but also the roots, as I always say, from Rome and from Athens. For me, as you the Christians, we should take pride in Jerusalem as the capital of monotheism, Athens as the capital of democracy, and Rome as the capital of the rule of law. Those are the key pillars of what Europe is, and we should defend it with every fiber that we have. Thank you so much, Juan, for taking the time. You're welcome. Thank you for the invitation.